All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Yeah, is that my cue oh, yeah. call or are you gonna? Yeah, sorry, we've got the red <laughs> dot. I was looking for where that was. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, uh, Use Open Source, Bare Metal, and 5G to Achieve Autonomous Drone Delivery. That's exciting. Uh, I'm Paul Burt. I'm a technical product marketing engineer at NetApp and a cloud native ambassador. So I'll be moderating today's webinar. Uh, I'd like to welcome our presenter today, Cody Hill, field CTO at Packet. And a couple housekeeping items up top here. Uh, during the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee. Uh, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, though. Please feel free to drop your questions in there, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, Cody sounds like he's uh, up to the challenge of answering things as they come in, but if your question doesn't get answered live, uh, I'll uh, uh, sift through them and make sure he uh, gets a glance at them at the end. And uh, this is an official webinar of the CNCF. And as such, it is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. So uh, please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, uh, just be respectful to your fellow participants and presenters. Uh, the recordings and slides will be posted later today on the CNCF webinar page. That is uh, cncf.io slash webinars. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Cody to kick off today's presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Really appreciate it. <clears throat> so as Paul said, uh, I'm Cody Hill with Packet, Field CTO, um, and we'll be talking about uh, the work that we've done today, <clears throat> the, we've done with Sprint um, on their uh, IoT Curiosity platform uh, and kind of diving into a, a use case that we uh, have with drone delivery. So uh, a little bit about me, it's that classic slide that all presenters give. Um, I've been in the tech industry for 15 years, uh, started out at an ISP. I was the guy told, telling you to unplug it and plug it back in uh, and kind of worked my way up into uh, being a cloud architect at General Electric. And then I uh, have been in a few startups uh, here and there. And uh, hey, Mark, if you want to go on mute, that'd be great. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so um, been at a few startups here and there, and I joined Packet in the fall of 2019, uh, but I've been a customer of Packet since uh, 2015. So great product, and so I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, so as Paul mentioned, uh, I'd encourage you to ask me questions, right? The Q&A inside Zoom is there. Uh, so go ahead and drop questions in, and uh, I'll go ahead and try to answer them as I go. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to get somewhat geeky and techy on some of this stuff. So if you have questions, I want to make sure we, we catch everybody up before we, we move forward. So go ahead and do that. Um, so here's the agenda for today, right? Uh, we have a quick introduction about Packet, um, a little bit of talking about what the Sprint Curiosity Network is um, and how that kind of pertains to Packet. Um, and, and then we want to talk about how you could deploy uh, physical servers on the edge of uh, Sprint's Curiosity Network. Right, so you get extremely low latency to the, the end devices um, there. And then uh, once you have these, uh, these servers, right, uh, nobody really cares about physical servers, right? They care about the applications that run on those servers. So what does it take to turn a normal server into um, a, an IoT warehouse and an analytics tool so that you can start analyzing your data from all your IoT devices? Um, and then we're going to basically uh, show you, you know, how to put that software on the hardware and do a live demo. And then everyone's going to leave today with um, the GitHub link to all of the code I'll be demoing today, as well as a promo code to uh, get into Packet and get some free compute credits and try it out yourself. Okay. So a little bit about Packet, right? So um, as of last week, we have just been acquired by Equinix, right? So we're no longer a, a small startup company. We're now um, part of Equinix, and we're really excited about that. Um, and we have about 20 plus cloud locations, about 130 members in, on the, uh, the packet side of the house. Uh, we were founded back in uh, 2014 um, by our, our CEO and a few others that have been in the infrastructure space for quite a while. And um, the cool thing about our platform is it's, it's bare metal you, uh, that you can spin up just like a cloud, right? So you get a server in as little as 60 seconds. 
and we have over 60,000 servers being uh, deployed and destroyed uh, every month, right? So um, quite a bit of, uh, you know, wear, wear on chair on that hardware, spin it up, tearing it down. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, one of our marquee customers is Sprint, right? And uh, Sprint had the opportunity to say, let's, let's throw out everything that we know about a cellular network and let's start from scratch and really build a network um, that's for the modern day. And, and let's focus this around IoT and, and an edge use case, right? So um, they came out with uh, what they're calling their curiosity core. And um, they could have gone to any of the public clouds or try to build their own uh, data centers and, and do all of that, right? Because they're sprint, they're massive, they can do it. And what they realized is that their core competency isn't uh, hosting data centers or, or dealing with servers. Their core competency is that networking side of things. So they partnered up with Packet, and what Packet is allowing them to do is they put their finger on a map anywhere in the U.S., and they say, I want to have a 5G network in this city. And Packet will do all of the things necessary to deliver them a REST API with physical servers that they can provision with all the networking they need in less than 90 days. Right, so uh, they can go into any market anywhere in the U.S. and and pack it on the hook to deliver that. So this has become a great partnership, and I think we're live in 22 uh, cities around the U.S. now, um, and and more to come in 2020. Right, so that's that's what Sprint's doing um, with Packet, and so um, we we decided let's let's show some people how to utilize this IoT network and leverage Packet and all of that. Right, so um, this is you know you you can have it. Uh, however you like, right? So you can create your own servers on Packet. Uh, we have a, a nice web UI off to the right here. Um, you can use a REST API. That's an actual curl command that will spin up a server for you. Um, or use the automation framework or language that you want. Terraform, Ansible, Golang, Python, right? Whatever, whatever language or, or tool you're comfortable with, um, you could spin up physical servers on the edge uh, of uh, the Sprint Curiosity Network that will get you extremely low latency um, access to your end devices, right? Whether those are drones that are transmitting a lot of data um, or standard warehouse machinery that are sending temperature and, and things like that, right? So um, you could spin up those servers on the edge. Um, but servers aren't, uh, like I said earlier, aren't the most exciting thing about this, right? Uh, a server without an application is useless, right? So it's, it's really about the IoT software that goes into it. So um, we worked with some, some friends of Packet, some really smart folks, um, and we put together what uh, we, we think the best of breed open source technologies um, that will allow you to build an end-to-end -end IoT pipeline. And um, really capture, store, visualize all of that data uh, so that you can, uh, you know, really leverage the, the, all of the data coming off of, in this case, drones, right? So we, you can see the drones at the bottom. Um, and, and really what, what they're doing is they are uh, transmitting a, a JSON payload to Emitter, which is an open source MQTT broker. Um, that is then tied into the open FAS um, and Alex Ellis uh, helped us out with this um, from OpenFaz. Um, and it, it's tied into different topics inside of that. Um, and then certain functions inside of OpenFaz are doing inserts in the databases. Um, we have functions to render a map so we can see where these drones are live on a map. And I'll show you that in a demo in a minute. Um, and then uh, we can actually read the data out of, uh, out of the Postgres database as well. And then kind of for free, some of the things that you get with uh, OpenFAS is you get um, Prometheus monitoring of all of your functions and all of that. So every time you ingest something that goes into Prometheus, you get some nice Grafana charts to show you how that ingestion rate and all of that is working. Um, and then we've, we've layered on uh, Metabase, which is a business intelligence tool, and Mapbox, which is a visualization tool. And so this is all kind of layered together to kind of get you a lot of visualization and some intelligence into that data. So let's kind of break these uh, things down for a minute, right? So uh, the first piece of this is Kubernetes, right? So all of this runs on top of Kubernetes. Um, in this example, we chose K3S uh, because K3S was specifically designed to be the Kubernetes at the edge, very minimal installation of Kubernetes, uh, very lightweight. So we said, hey, that's, that's a great use case to uh, deploy that, right? So I assume everyone on this call is familiar with Kubernetes, right? Uh, 
but um, we can cover it a little bit, right? So um, Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration framework, right? So uh, whether you're using Docker or uh, just Containerd, it, it basically orchestrates deploying um, your container workloads across one or multiple servers and uh, then handles all of the, the plumbing from uh, getting you ser services, your services delivered to it, you know, ingress access, um, it, it can handle scaling those in an automated fashion um, and really allows you to care less about your physical infrastructure and, and kind of let Kubernetes orchestrate all of that for you, right? So um, pretty cool uh, application framework works really good uh, with all of the components that we have here. And it's really the way the industry is going. Everything is being built to run on top of Kubernetes. So why not build ours that way as well? Okay, um, so, so the next piece of, of code that we need is emitter, right? So emitter is uh, an open source um, MQTT broker. And one of the, the things that we really liked about emitter um, was that it's horizontally scalable, which you don't get in a lot of uh, MQTT brokers, right? So as, as you need to scale up the amount of ingestion points, you can just create more and more replicas of emitter and it'll, it'll handle that, that scaling for you. Um, and then it, it was built from the beginning to be super fast and secure, right? So every single topic inside of the MQTT broker um, has the ability to um, be protected by a, a, an authentication token. So um, it, it really keeps you from, you know, it keeps your, your data secure and your ingestion points secure. Um, so we like, we like emitter. Um, and then to kind of the, the glue and kind of the heart of this that, that kind of puts everything together um, was open fast. We said, um, you know, we, we could possibly uh, write some custom code and build our own containers and, um, you know, build our application to ingest the data from emitter and dump it into a SQL database and then, you know, build some, some code uh, inside of our app to render a, a database map for Mapbox and stuff like that. And uh, we said, you know, why, why not use a serverless framework? Um, such as OpenFAS. And so that, that worked out really well. And, and with OpenFAS, um, it kind of obfuscates all of the, the complex things inside of Kubernetes and allows you to just kind of focus on, um, you know, your code, the functions that you want to deploy, um, and, and distills everything down to the Docker container level, right? So it, it makes the, the barrier to entry to consume Kubernetes uh, pretty low, right? So we really like OpenFAS, so we decided to use that here. Um, Next is Prometheus, and we kind of talked about that, right? So if you're not familiar with Prometheus, right, it's um, Cloud Native Compute Foundation project, right? So go CNCF. Um, and it's a, a monitoring system that will basically scrape your data endpoints. So it actually reaches out and collects data for you, right, other than you having to shove data or push data into it. So all you have to do is host a, a REST API, and it'll start scraping that REST API for for information, right? So it's going to be pulling in your metrics and it's underneath it, ultimately, it's a time series database. So it's very efficient to store all of the metrics that are coming in and then display them on a graph and, and do those types of things, right? So um, Prometheus is probably, I think, has won the format or for modern uh, monitoring systems. And uh, it, it's, it's great in this scenario and we'll kind of show a little bit of that in a minute. Um, and then Grafana, uh, if there, there was a war for visualizing all of this data in an open source way, Grafana definitely has won that. Um, and Grafana is a great um, visualization and analytics engine. It allows you to tie in almost any data source. In this case, we're using Prometheus. We could use Postgres, um, but almost any data source. And then you could build beautiful graphs and charts and all of the things to kind of visualize that data and kind of do trends and, and all of those things. So it's, it's really great. Um, to store all of this data, um, we chose Postgres. Um, and we chose Postgres because it's been around for a long time, it's really stable, um, and we didn't want to get extremely creative on uh, that aspect of it. We could have chose CockroachDB or Yugabyte or some of the new, newer cloud-native scale-out um, you know, databases, but we just wanted to keep it simple in this example, so we chose just a standard Helm chart for uh, Postgres, and uh, we went and deployed that. And if, you're not familiar with Postgres, it's been around for a long time. It's an open source relational database um, and has, has come a long way and, and has been adopted by quite a few uh, 
cloud thinking and, and scale out database companies such as Cockroach and, and uh, Yugabyte DB, they've standardized on PostgreSQL um, in that. So in this example, if you did need to spread this data, you know, into multiple geographic locations, um, all of this code would be uh, easily replaced by just replacing that database with Yugabyte. And now you have a, a distributed system as well, right? So um, Postgres was a good option here. And then we have Mapbox, right? So uh, Mapbox is a really cool uh, piece of software. And um, really what it allows you to do is um, visualize any type of ge geographic map data. Um, and, you know, it kind of overlays it on top of Google Maps. Um, you can then, uh, you know, put different types of points and things on that map. Uh, so in this case, we have, we want to visualize where our drones are going, right? So our drones are starting at the hangar. Uh, they're then going to make their deliveries at a couple se separate warehouses, and then they're going to come back to the hangar. And we kind of want to see see what that looks like in real time and where those drones are. Um, and Mapbox really helps out with that. Uh, so great tool there. And then lastly is Metabase. So uh, Metabase is a business intelligence tool. Right? It's open source, and um, one of the cool things about it is that it uh, starts making some intelligent decisions for you, right? So it starts correlating data and says, hey, this looks like coordinates data. Let me build a map and put that on there. Hey, does this map look good to you? you go, oh, yeah, that's great. I need to build that map, right? And it's going to start seeing um, different trend data with, you know, maybe the battery is starting to deplete automatically on these drones. And it's all, it sees the same pattern. It's like, hey, you probably want to see this on a chart next to all these drones. And it'll build that chart automatically for you. And so you just need to tweak a couple things here and there, but it's actually an intelligent business intelligence tool, right? So you don't have to be the only one bringing intelligence to the party. Uh, so we really like Metabase for this. It was great. Cool. So <clears throat> now we talked about the software. We talked about deploying servers at the edge in the past. So how do you actually get this thing deployed uh, all together and, and marry this stuff together, right? So what we did is we built a uh, Git repository, right? So you guys can all go to this thing. It's uh, github.com slash packet labs slash IOT. Okay. And in there, there's a case directory, right? So uh, inside that case directory, there's some Terraform scripts. And off to the right, a screenshot of what it looks like when uh, the Terraform playbook is finished. So basically, you go in and say Terraform apply. You have to fill out a couple variables, right? Uh, but Terraform apply, it kicks this thing off. End to end, you now have the exact stack I'm talking about up and running, ready for you. And you can start sending metrics to it and start visualizing it. So anybody that wants to play or test with this after the call uh, can definitely do this. And, and at the end, we'll be giving out a, a free promo code on packet that'll get you one of our small servers for about 60 days, right? So it's a decent amount of money uh, to go play with uh, some of these servers. Right, so we're gonna actually jump into a, a live demo now and kind of show you what all this looks like. And I don't see any questions yet, so if you guys have any questions so far, right, make sure you're using the Q and A channel. I'm not looking at the chat. Uh, drop any of your questions into that uh, Q and A box, and I'd be happy to to answer them. Okay. All right, live demo. Let's do it. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to deploy a new uh, a new software stack, right? So this is our uh, our software stack. We have uh, Terraform Apply. Um And the, the question, I just got a question in the chat, is why use Trafic instead of Istio? Um, and the, the short answer is that Trafic is built into K3S. It fit all of our needs and completely worked. So we didn't uh, decide to uh, deploy K3S without an ingress controller and replace it, right? Um, Istio is great, but uh, Trafic worked good for our uh, our use case. Cool. Um, so let's go ahead and deploy um, Terraform Apply. And uh, we're going to do an auto approve here. So um, this thing is going to spin up, uh, create a new system. And we're going to flip over to the packet UI and kind of watch this thing happen, right? So here's um, our CNCF uh, project inside of packet. And we should see a new server pop in here in just a second. There it is. So we're building K3S01. Um, and so this thing's gonna spin up. And, and while that spins up, we do have another question. Um, 
let's see, correctly in his self-defending since there's no mention of security. Um, yeah, so I didn't really dive into the security aspect of this. We, we do have a cert manager on this, so you can, um, you know, we do have TLS uh, encryption over this thing. Um, but yeah, we, we didn't really dive into protecting this, uh, this pipeline, right? Um, there's a lot of things that you can do. You know, Istio from a service mesh standpoint would be great. Um, really, we, inside of the, uh, the presentation, we threw in um, the, the cert bot and all of that to keep the edge kind of secure and at least SSL encrypted. But yeah, there's definitely a lot you can do from a security standpoint to keep this app more secure. Uh, no questions out there. Uh, as well as emitter, we chose emitter that all of your MQTT data is, uh, is authenticated as well. Great, so um, we have this system up and uh, it's, it's spinning up. So we have another environment that's already up and running and I kind of want to uh, drop you through all of, uh, all of these things, right? So um, first is the uh, OpenFAS portal, right? So jump, jumping into OpenFAS, you could see uh, we have uh, the render map function, we have our database reader function, we have our database inserter uh, function. We also have our, our MQTT publisher function that's bringing the data from uh, emitter and, and shoving that into uh, the database or uh, into the queue so that we can insert it into the database. Um, so that's great. Uh, you can see that, um, you know, some of these functions have been called, you know, 24 times. Database readers have been called quite a bit more than that. Um, and then all of this data goes into uh, Prometheus and um, can then be visualized uh, right here, right? So um, you can see we've had almost 72,000 total requests through OpenFAS, right? Um, and so uh, we, we allow uh, the quick visualization, you get this for free using OpenFAS, what's your function execution rate? How many replicas do you have? How long does it take to uh, the duration of this? All of that. Um, we got another question in the chat. Uh, how do you how do you remote boot edge hosts with an operating system, right? So um, that's what Packet does. The entire company was based on let's build a bare metal cloud, um, and so there's really no uh, secret sauce to you know provisioning a a physical server, right? You need to uh, connect to it via IPMI and power it on. It's then going to get a DHCP IP address. And in the DHCP tags, it's going to send it to um, connect to a Pixie server, right? In, in our case, iPixie. At that point, uh, everyone knows how to do that. And you can then load up, uh, you know, Red Hat has instructions, Ubuntu has instructions, all of those folks have instructions on using uh, an image from them and using um, a kickstart file to deploy an operating system. What we've really done is put a, a lot of our intelligence in uh, to that uh, boot environment that, that comes in. We've uh, basically made it a, a dockerized environment that would allow you to make a lot of really smart, intelligent decisions at that point to deploy the server. Uh, and then we built a metadata service uh, that coincides with that so that you can use things like cloud init uh, and user data to actually turn bare metal into a cloud, right? So um, that's kind of the secret sauce behind Packet and what we do, and that's how we provision those servers on the edge. Um, so once you have your uh, Grafana up and running, hey, we have a lot of cool stuff, um, we can actually jump in here and uh, visualize uh, what we have for Mapbox, right? So uh, you can see here we have uh, Northwest Vegas. Uh, we have a warehouse. We have a warehouse over here in Northeast Vegas. Um, and we have a cluster of drones here on top of the hangar, right? That's where all those guys are. So um, if we wanted to send those drones on their mission, um, let's go ahead and kick this guy off, right? So we're going to uh, kick off our test pipeline to deploy these drones. And we're going to see in just a minute, um, it takes a minute to build the flight plans and send all the instructions out. Um, but these drones are going to start uh, taking their flights over to uh, their respective warehouses to make their deliveries, OK? Um, so that takes just a, just a second, so we'll go, come back to that. Um, these are the instructions that are being sent uh, back and forth, right? So it's telling everything where to go. Um, and this should be refreshing if that's going. Let me just refresh this real quick. Uh, I don't know if I gave enough uh, to the demo gods this morning. Oh, no. Oh, no. 
<laughs> um, great. So uh, these guys should be painting on the map. They're not. Uh, let me close this warehouse and see if this still works. It does not. Okay, so that's great. <laughs> um, so this is supposed to be showing drones flying from uh, from this hangar to the Northwest Vegas uh, deal, and then from this hangar to the Northeast. Um, you can then close a warehouse and all these drones will come back home. Um, or you can grab an individual drone, click on it. You can see the, the battery life, where it's going, its speed, where, where it's coming from, um, and you can send it back to the warehouse if you needed to. Um, so it's unfortunate that uh, this isn't working. Um, so it says they all return to hangar. Let me try this one more time and I'm gonna give up on it. Um, so while that's going on, um, we'll check on it in a minute. This is all the visualization data from when the drones are making their run, right? And so this is what Mapbox or Metabase does for you. Uh, the previous deal was Mapbox. Um, and uh, it basically shows, it starts building uh, graphs for you that are pretty smart, right? So th this is one that we didn't have to uh, really, really mess with. And it's just a, uh, any warnings or errors the drones are sending out um, and where they were when those errors or warnings happened, right? So you could see that uh, we have quite a bit in this area here and we're wondering what's going on. Well, if we go up here and look at our uh, high wind map, this is a, a very high wind area inside of Vegas. So these drones are having issues staying on course. There's a lot of wind going on there, right? Um, you can see the uh, average payload versus battery drain, right? So if um, the payload is much higher than the, the battery drain and they, you know, they, they might end up running out of, uh, out of battery life before they can make their, their delivery, right? So this is part of, part of understanding um, understanding these and, and we, we had, that's why the, the controller is a bi-directional communication, right? So it's sending uh, information again, the map's still not working. Um, and so we can actually, uh, with, that, with that data, we can make that quick analytics and say, hey, this drone's not going to make its uh, delivery because its battery is draining way too quickly. Let's bring it back to the, the hangar before it has an issue. Uh, one of the other things that the controller does is Say these two drones are on a collision course. Let's avoid that. Let's move them out of the way so they don't collide with each other. Okay. Um, and so uh, you you get all of that, and this all basically comes for free with very little work inside of uh, Metabase, right? So you can see all of this. Um, pretty cool charting. Um, there's a few other things that you can uh, dive into here, right? You can go directly into Postgres. Um, look at the uh, drone position table. Sorry, I shouldn't have clicked on that. There's this lightning bolt uh, to x-ray this table. That's something that they call. And, and so there's just more analytics that you're building on the fly on just a, a database, right? So you can start seeing uh, the drone's position by bearing, drone's position by battery drain. All of these things are just uh, charts that they, they're just building for you, thinking this might be useful. I see some, some trend data here. And they're putting them on a chart in an automated way for you. Um, so pretty cool stuff that, that Metabase does. Um, and you can see that this environment is now done. Uh, we've, we've spun up a brand new environment. Uh, if I jump over to Packet, you can see this server's online. And uh, let me cross my fingers for the de demo gods. Hey, we have a new, uh, a new map rendered for that new endpoint. Okay, so um, that works. I am going to try <laughs> to make this one work and uh, pray that it works. So let's try that. So let me uh, SSH into You can do it. I know you can. Try this. Oh, 
Well, I don't want to do too much of this live. Uh, it looks like I might be having an issue with some of my environments, so that's great. Um, it's up here, though, so I'm not sure why. Uh, oh, and now it's not. Great. Um, <laughs> so it looks like I'm having an issue. Um, we can figure that out later. Um, I would like to go back to uh, any questions you guys have and uh, back to the slide deck here. Um, so basically, it's the end of the demo there, right? So uh, wh what we do want to do is for anybody else to try this out, and we might need to do a couple pull requests to get this thing up and running, um, is um, go over to bare metal, uh, baremet.al slash IOT. That'll take you to that same GitHub repo that I was showing. And when you sign up for your packet account to deploy this, if you use promo code curiosity100, it's going to give you $100 in free cloud credits <clears throat> so that you can uh, either try this or any other project that you're working on. Um, you can actually spin up some free, uh, free compute credits and or some free servers and test them out $100 worth. Um, and and do your thing. So um, that's that's all I have for today. Uh, any other awesome. questions? Go ahead and throw them into the uh, Q and A window. Yeah, thanks, Cody, for the great presentation. Uh, so we do have some time for some questions. Uh, so there is a Q and A tab at the bottom of your screen there, and you can uh, enter your questions in there. I, I see one question or more statements that are questions like demo gods exclamation point so since that came up uh, multiple times during the the talk here while people think of real questions um what what are the traditional sacrifices that you make to the demo gods cody yeah you know normally i i, I get down on my knees and and beg them to to make it uh, go well that's that's normally my repertoire that, that um, sounds like a good one maybe I, rmrf some directories here and there that sort of thing Right. Yeah. You know, I, I fully tested the demo end to end this morning and it worked without a hitch. So why wouldn't it work live? Uh, no, not sure. Yeah. Um, it, it, it happens <laughs> to all of us. I think it happened to me on my last live demo. So um, I, I think you have more support uh, for this sort of stuff than may feel like in the moment. Um, but we do have one <laughs> question that's come in. Uh, so uh, how do you manage multiple edge clusters? That's from Binu. Yeah. So um, it's a good question, and there's a lot of different uh, thoughts out there. Um, so in, in my opinion, I think my best uh, efforts are spent um, higher up the application stack than managing Kubernetes itself. Um, so I would go with a vendor-supported model, right? So uh, folks like Rancher, uh, folks like uh, Platform9, um, any, anybody else that's in the Kubernetes ecosystem and kind of participating, I, I would go with those guys to um, help me kind of manage those clusters around the globe so I don't have to build a huge operations team to do that. Um, I think a, a different question might be, um, how do you interconnect those clusters together and then how do you uh, allow them to communicate um, inside of Kubernetes? So um, Istio has, uh, is a, a great option for a service mesh and they now have the ability to, I think it's called through Istio gateways, where you can have multiple separate clusters that are then uh, you can then map pods uh, so that they can talk to each other across uh, through that Istio gateway um, and it shares service discovery across that. Um, HashiCorp Console Connect uh, can do that as well, right? So they have a great option there to do multi-cluster Kubernetes uh, to allow your services from both of them to talk in a secure fashion. Um, and then a new project that Rancher just came out with is uh, Submariner, which is really cool and interesting. Um, I, I like it a lot. Um, and Submariner uh, basically creates IPsec tunnels between, uh, an IPsec mesh between uh, one to many clusters and allows service discovery and pod discovery uh, across all of them. So um, some pretty cool tech out there to help you interconnect these clusters, but actually doing the day-to-day -day operations and doing upgrades and all of that, I'd be looking for a, a Kubernetes control plane, which there's quite a few available out there. And the Rancher yeah, one's free, you just pay for support. That's a great point on uh, thinking beyond just the install and looking at the day two and ongoing maintenance and all that. Um, we have some other requests in the chat. Uh, number one is, uh, what is that GitHub URL? Uh, that's from uh, Ed. Yep, so uh, the, the, the quick one, the, the short link to get there is uh, baremet.al. 
uh, so bare, like bare metal, but there's a dot right here, uh, slash IOT. Uh, cool. So that, that's a short link to that GitHub. Yeah. Great. Um, and then we have another request for a slide uh, previous in the deck. Um, Cedric has requested, uh, you can throw the chart up showing the architecture. Yeah, so this is also on that GitHub link. Uh, you can see that picture. Um, let me uh, present this again and make it a little larger so that you can see it. Um, I got it a few cool. times. And then um, uh, we have another question that? from uh, Binu. Um, he has a question about, uh, is AMQP possible in K3S, going for the, the older protocol to MQTT? Yeah, so, um, so K3S isn't what uh, really cares or manages the AMQT broker or uh, AMQP or MQTT. That's more of a plugin to OpenFAS. Um, and, and to be honest, I don't know for sure if OpenFAS has an AMQP broker uh, off the top of my head. Uh, we'd have to Google OpenFAS AMQP. Uh, I'm sure it's there. I do know for sure that uh, like another serverless framework that's called Fission, uh, Fission.io, which is a Kubernetes-based serverless platform that's fully open source. I do know they have an uh, AMQP broker for sure. So if you uh, are using AMQP and OpenFast doesn't have the connector for you, check out Fission. Uh, they might be a good option. Very cool. Uh, we have a question from Prakash. Uh, OpenFaz, uh, how does it help you simplify your Kates cluster implementation? Yeah, so, um, the the Kate's implementation it doesn't make uh, Kubernetes any more um, the implementation of Kubernetes any more easy or, or difficult. Um, what it really makes is the uh, learning all of the constructs of Kubernetes, right? Deployments and auto scalers and services and um, building your Docker containers and all of the things that you have to the barrier to entry that a developer needs to figure out to consume Kubernetes is is not low right it's not a very it's not just hey here's kubernetes go and like they were they were fine it's it's definitely not that way and so what openfast does for you is it gives you a much more uh uh graded way to get into consuming kubernetes where you're really just caring about the functions that you're writing this is my code i'm going to write that code i'm going to deploy it to openfast and openfast is going to figure out how to just dis uh, distribute it for me it's going to give me an ingress point so I can execute that code. Um, I could do all of those things and I don't need to figure out how Kubernetes specifically does all that for you. Very cool. And uh, we'll close on this uh, last question. Um, Sai asks, uh, what is the latency across the emitter and drone? So uh, it obviously depends on the distance. Uh, from the drone to the tower, uh, and then uh, from the tower to the server, right? So that's that's the big thing that we're, uh, that Packet and Sprint are, are shoring up, is we're putting these servers um, as close to the tower as possible, um, so that you can uh, really get, you know, sub millisecond latency from the, the termination of the tower over to your server. Uh, now, uh, the, the drone's transmitting data. You're probably dealing with a couple milliseconds there to, uh, depending on, you know, are they a mile away from the tower or five miles from the tower? It's gonna, it's gonna change things, but not dramatically. Um, so uh, round trip, we're, we're definitely talking, you know, sub five milliseconds, right? Which is, which is pretty good, right? Um, and uh, in a lot of cases, you're, you're sub three milliseconds. That is very cool. Well, uh... I need to prep my script, but you had a code at the end there uh, for everyone to go check this out and get some credits on Packet. I love stuff like this where we get to see tech kind of interact with the real world. And um, I'm actually personally gonna bookmark this code because I'm, I'm excited about the, the ARM64 stuff Packet has uh, available for me to tinker with. So I'll, I'll be using it on that. Um, so with that, uh, we'll be uh, closing things out here. So great. Uh, thank you, Cody, for the great presentation. And uh, all right, that's all the questions we have time for today. Uh, thanks for joining us today. The webinar recording and slides will be on later today uh, on the CNCF website. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.